Greetings, everybody. I'm Drew McClellan. If we have not met before, uh, I co-own Agency Management Institute with my brilliant partner, Danielle Nuko McClellan, who, as you might guess by the last name, is also my bright wife. Uh, we are super excited about this series. So AMI has been around since the late 90s, actually. And our whole goal is to help agency owners and leaders run the business of the business better. So we focus on the back of the house stuff. HR, finance, technology, biz dev, succession planning, leadership, things like that. Most agency owners are accidental business owners. So they somehow found out one day that they owned an agency. And next thing they knew, they had a couple of employees and all of a sudden had to figure out things like HR issues and finance and how to read a P&L and all of that. And so our goal is to help you do that better, help you make more money, keep more of the money you make. And so it makes perfect sense to us to host this webinar series, which is really just looking at how agencies are leveraging this technology. AI isn't necessarily new, but it seems like in the last year or two, everybody is paying attention all of a sudden and starting to take advantage of it. And so Kathleen, uh, who uh, we have known for several years, um, is part uh, was part of an agency owner peer group, uh, started a digital shop at the young age of about 12, I think, grew it to be very large uh, because she really has a sense of embracing technology and how to bring that into the agency space, is an expert uh, inside AI. And when I say an expert, what I mean is, is experimenting with it, using it on a regular basis, learning about it every day, and is also teaching an MBA course on AI at Rice University. So we asked her to put together this webinar series. This is the third in the set. Uh, we're going to do at least six, and we may do more than that if there's a lot of demand. Uh, so with that, Kathleen, I'm going to hand it over to you and let you uh, drive. I'll watch the chat for questions. We will stop uh, at the end and have some time for questions, hopefully. Yep. But if you have questions and it seems like it's a good place for me to kind of jump in and interrupt, I will do that. Otherwise, I may save them for a little later. So Kathleen, you now have the con. Perfect. Thank you. I'm very excited. Um, and on our last um, webinar, we talked a lot about all the different AI tools that are out there. And one of the questions that came up is, you know, with all these different tools that are out there, is there a chance that ChatGPT can replace all of them? And while I don't think it's quite there yet that it's going to replace all of them, you know, I do think there's a right philosophy in focusing on whether, and ideally, I really love OpenAI and ChatGPT, but focusing on one core enterprise AI platform that your agency leverages, and then pull in a couple of unique circumstances to kind of really use it for different use cases. So I'll give the example of Runway, right? <clears throat> right now, um, ChatGPT and OpenAI doesn't really have a really great video um, journey of AI tool in its toolbox. And so we would leverage, let's say, something like Runway in the interim. Now, Soro is coming out. Um, they've released it to beta for several users. And so do you think that might change as things progress? So today we'll be taking a deep dive into OpenAI and the use cases, um, the different um, functionalities and tiers that are available. Um, we will actually end the session with showing you how to build your own custom GPTs. So I'll kind of walk you all through that live as well. But it's really interesting to see kind of the transformation. My background is in linguistics. And so it's been a, a long journey, if you will. And we saw a lot of what we call like AI wrappers that came out, which were just AI tools that leveraged existing language models, whether that was um, Llama, which is Facebook or Meta's LLM, or um, GPT, which is obviously OpenAI's. Um, and what we talk about a lot in our race course actually is we call it the red wedding, right? We've had like one red wedding. And if you're a big Game of Thrones fan, it's like where a lot of the AI tools that existed out there before are now kind of closing because there's become an easier democratization of larger enterprise systems. So I know even in our last series, we talked about different AI tools. We talked about contentware as one of them. And that's a prime example of a tool that was available that closed its doors because there's so much competition. And when you're looking as an organization to try out different tools, you're going to, the smaller of the pond that you use um, limits your kind of liability and upkeep and maintenance and changes to user policies and things of that nature. So 
it is a very interesting space. So wanted to take today to kind of deep dive into open AI. Before we do, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to see how this works, but can you raise your hand if you're using OpenAI, ChatGPT Plus, or Teams, or Enterprise? So the premium you're paying for ChatGPT. Let's see. Okay, awesome. Great. So this is really awesome to see. It's funny, we did this with, um, I'm teaching about 100 MBA students, um, and it's pretty close, but we're seeing about... 20% are using using premium or above features. So looks like you nice have a to... 10 raised hands, which would be a little shy of 10%, Kathleen. Yep. So it's a little bit less, but I will say, and some people might be finding their hands in the interim, but right now we see on average that people are using about 30% of the power of chat GPT. So they're not using it to its full capacity, um, which I'm hoping during this hour to kind of walk y'all through some of those options and, and changes from that perspective. So today we'll go over kind of just the different tier options that are available within ChatGBT, um, the features at a really high level. Um, we'll talk about considerations of organizational launch for a tool like this um, within your organization. We'll go over prompting 101, um, which is kind of fun because it's one of those things about a year ago, I was like, this is so important. And then like nine months ago, I was like, honestly, the AI is advancing so much. No one really needs to know about prompting. And now I'm eating my own words and going back to the importance of actually prompting correctly. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll do two live uh, builds of GPTs and kind of walk y'all through how to do those. One more simple and then a little bit more robust when leveraging kind of Zapier integrations and automation. So when we think about the different tiers within GPT, um, they have obviously the free, the free plan, which has a lot of limitations in terms of um, the language model. So it's on 3.5. They're currently um, looking at four primarily, um, which is a little bit more advanced. Um, it has limited inputs um, and APIs. Um, everything that you put into the free version is, you know, you hear that saying, if it's free, then you are the product. <laughs> and so if you're using the free version, it is using anything that you input and outputs as part of their training models. Um, premium, um, which is what they called at one point plus, um, gets you the 4.0 language model. It has access to advanced data analysis, Dolly, and web browsing, which I'll talk about in a minute in terms of some of those features. Anything in that input is also shared as part of the training for their models themselves. It's about $20 a month. Um, Teams is a new feature that rolled out um, mid-January, which is really awesome. I'm really happy to see that this happened. And what that does is it, it increases your messaging caps. So a prime example, I was working on my um, personal GPT OpenAI instance, which I'm on premium, and I capped out. Um, and it said, you can't ask anymore. You can't do any calls until 4.30 PM. And so I had to take a two hour break, um, which probably was needed <laughs> at a certain extent. Um, it also allows you to create and share custom GPTs within your own workspace. So you can really create certain things for your team to leverage to really get the most efficiency out of the tools. I found that to be really, really important, right? When we think about this rollout and depending on your team, um, you'll have individuals who are excited early adopters who are really engaged. Um, and then you'll have some of those who think that AI is coming for their jobs, right? And so what I found is if you're able to create these custom GPTs and build them within your workspace, you're actually able to help reduce the friction of any new users. Um, as I've talked to a lot of people, right, I hear this all the time, is it's not that good, it doesn't really work that well, things of that nature. And I think a lot of that is user error, right? And so if we create these custom GPTs, these custom prompt templates within this space, it makes these tools more efficient, more effective for your team that helps them continue to lean in. Um, there is an admin console for the workspace, which will help you do some management. It gives you some information as it pertains to who's accessing it, who's using it. You can even do recalls in terms of seeing some of their chats, things of that nature, which is valuable. Um, and by default, <clears throat> your training data is automatically removed from the training model for everyone. So in premium, it is shared for the training modules. You can turn that off, but it by default is turned on. Um, and that one's $25 per month per user. And they only require two users to get to the team's level. 
Um, enterprise is obviously more robust. You get 4.0 Turbo, which has unlimited access and really fast response rates. It's kind of incredibly crazy fast. Um, and then you have ongoing support. You have an assigned account person that help you with like dedicated onboarding for um, enterprise. So there is a lot of features in Teams and Enterprise that are about the same. To me, the main difference between the two is the number of users. So if you have less than 150 users, you should definitely go with Teams. Um, over 150 users, Enterprise makes a lot of sense, especially with that kind of access to APIs and to kind of support um, within their system. So this kind of overview gives you a, an idea. I mean, for everyone on the call and for most of the people I've interacted with through AMI, it's being part of AMI. Most likely Teams is your best bet, right? For $5 extra a month, you have a little bit more parameters in terms of usage, protection, um, and guardrails, which I think make a huge difference. So when we talk about some of these features, I talked about <clears throat> advanced data analysis, web browsing, and a few others. Now, the interesting thing is they've all kind of come into one. Um, so before you have to use, used to have to go into like Dolly on the left-hand rail, kind of activate it, and then you'd be able to interact with it. Now it's actually leveraging all that stuff within just the regular chat function and understands that if you're asking for some type of imagery that you're calling Dolly, or if you're uploading data that you're looking for code interpreter, which is now called advanced data analysis um, from that perspective. So we'll kind of talk through some of those at a high level. So the first one is Dolly 3, um, and this is now incorporated into the chat itself. Um, and it really helps prior, you used to actually have to go you used to prompt Dolly and it would generate your images, <clears throat> your image. And then if there was something you didn't like about it, you had to go back and basically take your initial prompt, modify it, hoping that you would get the version that you wanted. Now it maintains that dialogue based kind of interface. And so you can say like, hey, create me this image, but put it on a white background instead of a black background. Or um, can you make it more comic book like or more surreal um, versus realistic, things of that nature. Um, this is really great for um, social media images, brainstorming of um, and production for mood boards or storyboards. It's funny, I was just on a client call recently and we we're going over like TV storyboards and we had something in there that was like kind of stock, just we're going to shoot the whole thing, but we just had something in there to kind of show an idea of what we're looking for. And the client got caught up in some of the kind of nuances of the image that was selected from, I think it was like Shutterstock or something like that. And so this is a great way to like, if you have clients who get caught on stuff to be like, oh, hey, here's an example. And you're able to be more specific in some of the images that Dolly outputs, which is great. Um, I use it a lot for revisions or modifications of existing images. Um, it does a decent job of like resizing banners, things like that. Um, or imagery from presentation. So you'll see there's a lot of imagery in this presentation. A lot of it was built through um, Dolly, um, which is really great from that perspective. So I would, you know, given the complexity of <clears throat> intellectual property within um, AI itself and who really owns AI, AI output, would not use it for a major TV campaign or billboard or print ad um, without kind of a deeper understanding of how that might impact your client. Um, but it does make sense if you're going to use a Shutterstock image, this could be just as viable from that so perspective. Just a reminder, you know, there's all kinds of copyright issues with this still and all of those things. So yep. you're if you're going to use it for anything more than sort of mood boarding or things like that, A, you need to disclose to the client, this is not an image we could actually use in public. Uh, B, you need to have a really strong... AI policy and the legalities of all of that woven into your master service agreements and things like that. So just be mindful of that. We've done a couple podcasts and a webinar with IP attorney Sharon Torek on that topic. So you can learn more about it from yep. some of those resources. Perfect. Yes. I am not an attorney <laughs> um, from that perspective. Nor do you play one on TV. Nor do I play one on TV. No. Um, the next tool or kind of feature within ChatGPT that I really enjoy is advanced data analysis. This used to be called a uh, code interpreter, um, but code interpreter was a little limiting in terms of people thought it was just for coding. Um, and it's funny because I feel like they changed it to be advanced data analysis and then it limits it kind of the interpretation that it's not used for code anymore, but it can be used for both. Um, so I'll wonder if they'll ever come up with like a name that actually covers the full umbrella, but <clears throat> 
this is a tool that you can upload data, <clears throat> ask it questions, um, ask it to do visualizations, bar graphs, charts, line graphs, um, summarize um, kind of information from that perspective. Like if you're doing any type of research surveys, things of that nature, this is a great way. I'm a visual learner um, a lot of times. And so if I'm being asked to analyze like hundreds of rows of data, I'll upload it into our enterprise chat GBT because it's protected um, from that perspective. Obviously we strip out anything that could be extremely sensitive. Um, and then I ask it questions and ask it to do visualization, visualizations for me so that I can really kind of start thinking through some of the questions or areas that I want to take a deeper dive on. Um, this is great for client reporting. Um, it's really good for helping you extract certain data like metadata, um, as well as code review, summarization, and transformation. We talked a little bit about the copyright as it pertains to the visual side of things, but I think there is some concerns around copyright as it pertains to code base. So now the spectrum of this is pretty broad in terms of how um, strict your interpretations are of things, but there are some questions as to, from a coding perspective, was code interpreter um, and open AI models trained on a licensed piece of software from a code perspective and therefore potentially create some concerns in terms of who owns the IP of the output. Now, if you're not necessarily copywriting some of the stuff in the output, then I think you're okay there. But we typically primarily use it for um, code review. So um, doing QA work, helping analyze uh, or debug issues with code. Um, consolidate, remove technical debt, things of that nature, or looking at old code that was written by somebody who's no longer here, like maybe 10 years ago, and just say like, hey, can you help me understand what this line of, or what this code is doing and, and what it means? So just something to keep in mind and kind of discuss um, and look into further as it pertains to the code side of this. The last piece of this that really, I think, made a huge jump in the functionality of um, ChatGPT and OpenAI is web browsing integration with Bing. Um, there all also recently been some announcement that Bing is gonna produce a competitive search engine that's AI enabled um, that will compete with Google. So they're trying to take some of that market share away, um, which will be really interesting. But the nice thing about this, right? You've heard kind of all along, right? Some of the challenges with these LLM models is that you can't really update them per se, right? So when you think about how you train the models, right? There's a time limit, right? So you train them based on everything between, you know, up to let's just say January, 2021 or something of that nature, right? And you can't, there are things called rags, which um, if you really nerdy and want to talk about, we can definitely dive into where we're trying to figure out ways to update or enhance um, a model without having to rebuild the entire model in itself. And so when you think about it from that perspective, OpenAI and, and ChatGPT developed this integration with Bing that allows you as a user to reference documents or websites that are online to provide a more up-to-date viewpoint that the model takes into account when it provides your responses. So for example, um, like the Corporate Transparency Act, right? As agency owners, that's something we're all looking at. It's a new thing that we have to comply with um, this year. And, you know, I could say, obviously this is not something that was built into the model, but now that it's integrated with Bing, I can say, here's a link to the corporate transparency act on the U S treasury website, for example, can you summarize what this means and what I need to take, pay attention to. So when you think about, um, this, it really does help with augment information retrieval helps you give real-time web search and citations. So you can see here, it actually will give you like a quote, um, thing. So this will actually, if you roll over, it will actually provide you kind of like the full summary um, so that you can see that. Um, and it also will help you summarize recent articles or news and trends. Um, another great thing, I actually, when I was doing, if you attended last the last webinar, one of the things that I did was I actually built a prompt template that I use consistently and actually pinged different AI tools to help me gather all the information in terms of features, pricing, security, and so on that it actually aggregated all of that for me. So when you think about if you're trying to do like a wide sproth or if you're niching in a certain industry and you kind of want to do like a landscape evaluation, this is a great tool to use. Um, the one thing I would note on the web browsing piece is 
Um, it does have some minor limitations. I am a huge fan of perplexity AI. If you have not played around with that, I would strongly recommend it. It is basically web browsing on steroids um, when we think about ChatGPT. And as it actually references a lot of scholarly journals and things of that nature. Um, so look at Perplex AI. But the nice thing is that for 90% of your use cases, this will actually help solve what you're looking for um, from that perspective. There are instances where websites are now um, prohibiting um, these AI tools like ChatGPT to access their web information. So you might see that pop up. I will say I've been using this for God, well, seven months, 10 months now. And it's happened to me like three times total. Um, so it's very, very um, few and far between, but I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see more of it. So it doesn't work necessarily on like New York Times, for example, or something like that. So something to stay, keep in mind. There are a couple other features, um, voice, um, which is really cool. Um, and it is actually really strong, but that's only accessible on the mobile app. So if you're an agency owner, like I was, right, I'm always like on the go doing walks, running around with kids. Um, and sometimes I would use the open AI, um, like my chat GBT on app within my phone and actually do kind of like conversational and have it speak back to me on recording ideas or thoughts or random things, um, as they came to me, like at all hours of the day and night. Um, so know that that is there as well as um, it's incorporated kind of more of a multimodal in terms of imagery. And so you are able to upload images into the system to get responses on. Um, I've done it for some proofreading to see if like how accurate and successful it is at it um, and found pretty decent results in terms of asking it to proofread like a pretty large document. Um, and mainly for GSP, obviously it's not necessarily, if I gave them like, here's our checklist, I probably have gotten even better responses in terms of like brand guidelines from the client and things like that. Um, so that's, a, these are some of the new features and some of the new tiers. And so when you think about the consideration, oh, yes, Jason's already using the audio all the time. I'm not surprised, Jason. Um, but as we think about the utilization of like a, a team environment for your agency, some things to consider is um, one of the things I always tell people is to treat this tool or this AI like an, a very, very, very smart intern, right? At the end of the day, the team members on your agency should be responsible for the and accountable for the output of ChatGPT. You know, so if there is something that's being put in or it's giving you a response and it's actually a hallucination, they should really be using their own critical thinking to verify and validate that information. Um, this is also one of the things that we talk to our clients and when I've talked to individuals about, okay, that we use this technology, you know, I share that, you know, one of the values of having an agency partner who understands this is being able to validate and have the subject matter experts push the technology further, right? If you're looking at schema, for example, if you're using OpenAI to help you write schema for a client, yes, you're using it to help create efficiencies, but it has really been effective in getting the right output. And you need somebody who understands schema in itself, who maybe used to write schema by themselves, who can validate that everything's being done um, and productive in that way. Um, the other thing that we always tell, and I think this is important, Drew touched on it too, is transparency of when and how AI is being leveraged amongst your team. So anyone who uses it has to disclose when and how they're using it, especially as it pertains to client and product, because that does raise some concerns in terms of compliance um, and potentially some contradictions within your own MSAs that you have with your partners. Um, the one thing I'll note, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, that OpenAI team, when you talk to them and you read their bylaws, they maintain that you have access of the ownership of the inputs and outputs as much as you can, given the nature of AI generated content and that there are going to be similarities. So technically AI is giving you or open AI is giving you that ownership, but there's a huge caveat with the, as long as, as much as AI generated content can be owned, if you will. Um, and then the last thing I would say is as you kind of look at this from an organizational standpoint, make sure you have the right um, feedback mechanisms for your team to share, as well as ask questions, right? I've often find like, right, there are individuals who have a really different perspective point of view. 
And when you think about the power of AI and how it can help transform and create efficiencies within your organization, really understanding what those individuals do on a daily basis is key. And so somebody who is, let's just say a product manager might start to think through this and say like, oh, I'm going to try this perspective, or I'm going to try, um, I was thinking about how this could be used because I spend so much time on helping, for example, IT, I'm helping people um, that have issues setting up their Zoom accounts. So I'm going to create a chat, uh, a custom GPT that really helps them understand that. So I think really making sure you have those mechanisms for feedback um, to help answer questions, but also really to focus on, you know, what are some of their ideas in terms of how the technology can be leveraged to create efficiencies within your organization. Um, so those are some of the tips for success. And when we think about how to get started, if you haven't been using it as an organization, some things to think about is it's really great at synthesizing and summarizing your content. Um, and making it more accessible. So if you're, I mean, I've seen this happen so many times where I'm working with a director of marketing or CMO, and she wants all of the nitty gritty details in terms of like a report on performance, keywords, all of that data, right? And then once we all get it to the point where we're all happy and we're going through that report, the next thing I always get within like 72 hours of that meeting is, Oh wait, now um, can you give me an executive summary that I can send with my to my CEO or to the leadership, right? And so you're constantly doing a lot of summarization. So this does help significantly in taking some of those things where you need more of the in-depth and the more consolidated versions. Um, this is a great opportunity to help with documentation. As an agency owner, I was always the worst at documentation. And when I sold my agency in April of 23, right? A lot of the questions came around, you know, do you have a process for this? Do you have a documented process for that? And so when you think about where AI can be a, a huge asset for you all is really helping you develop documentation and policies for your agency. Um, it's also really great at translation. And um, now, Kathleen, is, oh yeah. Sorry, can you give an example of how you would use this to document a process? Just walk um, to a high level. Yeah. So for example, it could be, I need to draft a chat GBT, um, employee, uh, usage agreement, um, so that we make sure that we're staying compliant with our MSAs. Um, and here are some dot points and it'll draft a full agreement with signature lines to here's how we typically get work done. Can you develop a process document in terms of how a, um, we onboard a client? Um, so it does, it's, I mean, those are just a few of them, uh, PTO policy, a, um, it's really great at that kind of stuff. So, I mean, the options are endless, um, there is kind of like the rise of AI agents. So even if you were to use, for example, scribe, which is one of the tools I mentioned previously, that does a really great job of like screen recording and it will actually do PDFs with like screenshots of your actions in it. Um, but that's like a very like tactical, right? Like I need to know how to set up a zoom meeting, for example, within our company, N that's not really like an overview document that you would provide a private equity or a buyer in terms of how you go about doing work in your organization. And so you're able to say, okay, here are some of the PDFs in terms of what we need to do, but can you summarize at a high level, what is our approach or our process for, new client. So I would say more broad, less tactical is really great for chat GPT. Um, and I would use scribe for more of the tactical, like employee usage from that perspective. Um, and then the last one is proofreading. So I mentioned that it has some vision capabilities, which are pretty strong. And so that is another piece of this that that'll be coming down the road. So when we get to understanding, even when we talk about usage, different types of use cases, you know, one of the reasons why some individuals are more successful with ChatGPT or other AI tools than others is really centered around prompting. And these tips can be used in any model you'd want. So if you're using Claude, um, Claude 3 has been recently being pushed to beta, which is kind of exciting, um, but still not as performant as ChatGPT 4. Um, so it's kind of an interesting play. But these, these prompting tips will work regardless of the tool. Um, that you're using, but it does work specifically with um, OpenAI. And so when we think about developing the perfect prompt, and this is something that we really pride ourselves in terms of talking and training through with our team members, because like I said, 
we want to reduce the friction. So much about AI implementation within your organization is about change management, right? And so whether you've, I mean, I've done this too, right? We went, we were going to, we were going from Asana and we were going to do um, Advantage from a P, uh, product management system. And if you do not have the right individuals on the team, you don't have, I mean, you don't make it fr as frictionless as possible, it always blows up in your face. So needless to say, we didn't, even though we invested a ton of time and money, we never moved to advantage because it just became too difficult to get people to move. And they got frustrated with the process and I was not a good agency owner. And I finally just gave up. Um, and I'm sure many of you have had that experience. And so when you think about open AI, it's very similar to any other technology you try to integrate into your organization and you want to reduce the friction as much as possible. And one way to do that is teaching prompting. The second way is to creating these custom GPTs that people can use and start to see the value of what something like this might do for them. So when we think about prompting, I always tell individuals to focus on being specific and detailed. The more detail, the better. Um, before kind of OpenAI and ChatGPT had templates and prompt templates, I actually had like a Word doc where I would just like copy and paste like different prompts that seemed to work really well. And I just always had it open and I would modify it slightly and things of that nature. So, you know, when you think about being detailed as possible, you're like, oh crap, this is going to take a ton of time. Um, making sure you state your objective. So what are you trying to do? Are you trying to generate ideas? Are you trying to write a documentation for a process? Um, really kind of explaining what your ultimate objective is really helps you get the best response possible. Um, I also will specify the format. Do you want in bullet points, a summary? Do you want it to sound like a legal document? Um, I oftentimes will dictate, you know, if you're, I want it shown in a chart or a graph with this on the X and this on the Y graph um, axis. So being really specific in terms of the desired format is super helpful. Um, and that's not only in terms of the format, but also really providing as it pertains to who the audience will be in terms of um, the length. I found that oftentimes ChatGPT and a lot of the AI tools will give you pretty verbose language um, and tend to go on quite a bit. And so I oftentimes will be like a concise or a more succinct version of this. Um, and then I think, you know, providing context. So if you're on ChatGPT and you're on the Teams or premium plans, you're able to, and I think even now in the free version, you're able to upload a ton of information. So documents, PDFs, things of that nature. You can even link to things that are available um, provided that context. So if you're going to have ChatGPT write an article for your agency um, or help write content for your agency, you know, link to your top five visited blogs so that it can understand your tone and brand of voice. Um, it's interesting. I actually um, used ChatGPT recently to write a voice guideline for myself personally based on other articles I've written over the time. And I said, hey, based on these five articles, write me a brand voice guideline. Um, and it pulled that together. And I, asked, and I laid out specifics in terms of what I wanted included. And then know it's like an iterative process. So what's really great about this, these tools is that you can say, okay, I like this part of it, but rework this section to be X or Y or Z, um, which is super helpful. And this is the prompt template that I use all the time. So take on the persona of an insert, an expert persona. So a, um, you know, a HR um head of HR at an agency, a marketing and advertising agency, have them draft a employee agreement for ChatGPT usage that outlines the concerns and pitfalls around blah, blah, blah. Be sure to include that they can't use it for this, this, and this. We want the tone of voice to be um, like serious, but excited about the potential. And this will be targeted towards um, individuals who work at a marketing agency who have some technical experience. So that would be an example. And, the, and that's where you get the best outputs from that perspective. So we'll send this deck around, obviously, so you can kind of use this, but this is the one that I found like my Mad Libs version that I seem to find works the best. So now for the fun part, we're going to start, we're going to build two GPTs um, live on the call. Um, one live, one I'll kind of walk you through and show you how I did it. Um, so that you guys can see it um, from that. So when you think about building these custom GPTs, just some of the things I, you know, we kind of really kind of try to iterate is who, what is the use case, right? So what problem are we trying to solve? There's a great saying, and I've now kind of adopted it. She's um, one of the leaders at Google AI or Gemini, 
um, who said, you know, we're trying to take away the thunking, right? We want to focus on thinking, not thunking, right? So what is the use case? What thunking are you getting rid of? Is there value in getting rid of that thunking, right? Like how often do you see this problem or challenge or how often are you trying to do this? How long does it typically take? So for example, I was running through this with somebody I know and um, we're going through this process and he and I were talking and I was like, well, how long would that take you normally without kind of an AI assistance? And he said, you know, 15 to 20 minutes. And I'm like, well, is it really worth building a custom GPT for that? Let's talk about, you know, maybe what are some of the other ways that it can be used? And when he and I were talking, he was like, you know, trying to figure out, is there a way to validate, you know, should, if a client has multiple brands, do they need, you know, or sub brands, do it become like a family of brands, a house of brands? Does it become a nomenclature thing? Do they get their own logo? And I was like, well, that seems kind of like really difficult. Maybe let's think about how AI can help in terms of creating a synthetic focus group. So once you think you know where you want to go, you have some way to validate that as you move through the process. So that's where it's really important to think about what is the use case. The second is who will use this GPT, right? So right now, in terms of GPTs, you actually have to access it through the platform itself. So you have to understand kind of the technical capability. And one of the things that you want to think about is, right, like, for example, if you wanted um, a GPT that looks at, provides sales training, if the sales team can automatically get a hold of you on Slack very quickly and you respond very quickly, creating custom GPT isn't going to actually assist them. Now, if it was like my organization, and I'm sure a lot of owners on this call, right, I was, I would get asked questions all the time and it would take me like a hot couple of days to respond depending on where it was in Slack because I always get lost in Slack. And so honestly, if they didn't like run into my room and be like, hey, got a second, it probably would take a couple of days. So that's where a, a GPT would be helpful. Um, the other thing is what does success criteria look like? How are you going to check and QA the tool? What are you going to define as successful? Um, what documents can be part of your knowledge graph or your knowledge update for the tool? So start thinking through like, okay, do I need to create certain documentation so that I can train the model or does it already exist? And can we get it all formulated together? Um, and then how will you QA it? Um, which I think is really critical. So we'll go right now into ChatGBT and I will show you how this is done. I will also tell you one of the fun things that when you're going through this process, um, can you guys still see my screen? Yes. Thumbs up. Okay, great. Um, is we're I'm building one for um, like an HR employee handbook one. And one of the interesting things that I found is I uploaded all of our documentation, employee handbook, and I started asking questions and I was QAing it. And I was like, oh, it's not working. Like these aren't the right answers. And then I started to go back through the employee handbook and I was like, oh no, our employee handbook hasn't been updated in a while and needs to be updated, right? And so it's a great way to kind of double check those things. So to build the GPTs, um, and we'll go through this pretty quickly, um, you'll log into your GPT. This is my personal um, this is just like the plus premium account. I'm not on anything fancier than that. You'll go to explore GPTs on the left-hand side. You'll go to create. Um, and this will actually create your GPT. There's two ways to build them. You can configure them yourself or you can use an actual, like a like the AI model, the chats function itself to help build it for you. Um, I like to kind of go back and forth between the two. So we're going to call this like, um, this is a fake company that I made up, Smith Solar um, Sales Training Assistant. And then I'm going to go back to this side and I'm going to say, I want to create a step for my sales team that um, helps junior sales associates understand our product and offerings. And then I'm going to upload a training document for the sales team. And then you'll see it'll start kind of starting to respond back to me. It'll ask me some additional questions. It'll start building the GPT. Kathleen, so um, somebody's saying if uh, 
once the GPT is built, how do you release it to the world for others to use? Yeah. So when you, and I'll, you'll kind of start to see it. When you click save, you can say everyone, anyone with a link, only me. If you're on Teams or Enterprise, you can say those individuals um, that do, you, like it'll say like your team. So you can share it with anyone in your team. Um, I typically just right now, because these are all kind of like fake ones. I just do only me. Uh, if you do anyone with a link, you can get the link for the tool itself and send that out to people. Um, if you're on team, team or enterprise, you'll typically just enable like anyone within your enterprise or team account can access it just by search. Um, so this is, they've updated the name. So you can see like, as you go through here, um, it actually filled in the instructions. It filled in some conversation starters. So when you think about prompting, this gives you, um, everything from that perspective as well, um, in terms of those prompts. You can do, um, they do not have to be on ChatGPT4 to use it. They have to be on ChatGPT of some kind. So it can be 3.5 in theory. Now, if you're sharing it with someone in your team, they would have to be on your team account. So the $25 a month per user. Um, so this kind of creates all of that. Um, it will create a little icon. So yes, please do. This will generate um, an image for our GPT. And this is obviously using Dolly um, from that perspective. And I'm gonna, depending on how long this is a little slow. This is where team and enterprise really are awesome because it's like 18 times faster. So they created this image for, and it gave you some explanation as to the why. And then I'm gonna tell them yes to make that our image. So now it's there. So then I'll go into, yes, you can upload a ton of data. I found PDF and text work the same way. You don't have to do um, one or the other. It is important that you label the files, especially if you're gonna give multiple training documents. So if you wanna say, hey, for this information, use this reference, this document, for this information reference, that one, it helps with it. Um, there is a way to do web. Um, okay, that's fine. Um, so I'm going to publish this um, just so that you guys can see it in action. So this is just like a standard Word doc. Um, I had some headers in it. So this is it live. Um, so if I'm pretending I'm a sales assistant and I say, I have a potential sale. That I would like to convert. Um, if I'm pretending I'm a salesperson, it's going to reference the knowledge base, which is a document. Um, then you can provide it. So in my document, there is some things around early bird discounts, referral discounts um, specifically laid out in terms of things that we offer for a sale. Like I said, this is a fake sales company. Um, and then for example, this wasn't part of it. I can ask, what about tax? Sorry, I'm not good at typing under pressure. <laughs> what about tax incentives? Um, it'll reference my training document again um, from that perspective. And I think there's a couple of questions that came in in terms of um, training. So if you are on the team or enterprise, this is not being like these, they're like, think about it. There's like a moat around your own data. Um, and so this is a great kind of tool. So you do not have to worry about others kind of like quote unquote stealing um, that information. So this is a great, so this is an example of a simple GPT where you just upload information. Um, I'm going to walk you through a more complex one that I did, um, this weekend to show you kind of how to integrate with Zapier and customize even more data. So I'm going to go to this one. I'm going to do edit GPT. Um, so this is a social media crafter. So this GPT actually takes a link or takes articles that I've written and drafts a LinkedIn and 
Twitter um, tweet for me as it pertains, or I don't know if it's called a tweet anymore. Um, Can you really X? X, X, yeah, and yeah, an yeah. X post, if you will. Um, I uploaded, just so you guys can see, I uploaded a quote unquote brand voice guidelines for a consulting AI firm um, and created some prompts. Now, one of the things I'm going to show you quickly, and then this is in, if you go to uh, the deck, oh, I forgot, we'll go back to that. This is in the um, directions here. So you can kind of create these custom actions with Zapier, which really kind of supercharge your GPTs. So typically what you'll do is you'll write your instructions for your GPT. You'll create it as you normally would. And then when you go into actions, so I'll create, just so you can guys see. So there's a button on your GPT that'll say create custom action. You'll click create custom action. You'll have the ability to import um, that action or schema from a site. So um, if you go to this web page, which I can put, it's in the deck, but I can also make sure that Drew sends it out to you guys. You would just literally copy and paste this data into here. And it, it will pull in all this information. So this code base will automatically come in, the schema that tells the tool what to do. Um, it's the same one for all Zapier integrations. So you use the same exact one. And then it'll tell you, it'll get, post, and get. These are the available actions. Um, and then if you're, it requires some type of policy, privacy policy um, for this kind of function. So you would just post that in here. Um, so if you have your own privacy policy, you could update it with that in the link. Now, if you share it with only me, you do not have to have a privacy policy um, with your GPT to be included. So <clears throat> this goes ahead and kind of sets everything up from that standpoint. So you've already built your GPT, you've told it what you want it to do, you've gotten it kind of working from an output perspective, and this is just creating the Zapier integration. So what you do next is you have to update the instructions. So this is kind of all the piece that talks about it in terms of functionality. So this is, you know, you're going to create base, uh, incorporating emojis and hashtags. Um, there'll be custom actions that'll occur. This GPT will focusing on capturing the essence of the article in a concise, engaging manner, so, uh, suitable for social. So it kind of talks about all those different pieces. You're then going to copy and paste this section in from the bottom. So if you go to this document again, um, yeah, there's so many different so many different Zapier integrations. I could probably spend a whole month on this. Um, but what you'll do is you'll copy and paste this content here. So it's on that same link as before. You'll copy and paste that into your instructions. It'll be below your existing GPT instructions. And you're only going to change required actions down here. And so then once you have kind of this all set up, you will go to Zapier AI actions and you will create a new action. I've already created two new actions. They have a ton. So if you do a new action and you do um, Gmail, it'll tell you like send an email, draft an email, find an email, add a label to an email, things of that nature. So it has a lot of these already integrated. But this one, what I'm doing is I'm having it draft a social media post. I'm going to have it publish it into a Google Doc for me. So if you go into Google Docs, um, it gives you these different actions. So all this, and then you can say, have AI guess the value for this field as it pertains to document name, the content, you're definitely gonna wanna have AI guess the value for, right? Cause they're writing it. Um, and then you can also have it go into a specific folder. So you connect your Zapier account to your Google Drive, it does all this where you can say, put everything in this folder. There's more options here, including the action name. Um, so I set this up um, for Google Docs. So then what we're gonna do is you're gonna copy the action name and I typically use copy. And then you're going to paste it into the action here. And then they're gonna ask for a configuration link. So you'll just take this link and you will go to the link here and you're just gonna copy and paste this into your configuration link. So that's how you integrate it from that perspective um, on that end. And then I did another one, which you guys can see, we'll go back. Oops. Um, Got about see. eight minutes left, Kathleen. So let's wrap this up so you can answer questions. So just quickly, 
making sure with enterprise you can upload proprietary information, correct? Yes. Yeah. yes. You can. Um, this is Slack. So this is just the same one. I created a fake consulting group within a Slack channel. You have it go to a specific message. So this is the same thing as I did before. You're going to copy and paste the action and the link. Um, so the action being here, action name, and then the link from the URL at the top. And then you're going to save. Um, like I mentioned, if you don't have that, it'll do. Um, so we'll go to, so this is if you want to share it with somebody, this is the, the link. So if I view this GPT and I say, can you draft, oops, can you draft then post and tweet for the attached article? This is on rags, an article I wrote on rags. So it's gonna reference the knowledge base here. Now I'm not having to reference Zapier or anything of that nature. Um, then you can It'll go ahead and you'll have to sign in with your Zapier, allow. It'll start that action. And of course now it's not, what? Oh, there it is, starting action. And then we should take the last one. And then it'll give me the last piece. Um, give me the link. And then if I click this and I will pull up my, um, it'll confirm one last time. And I see there's some conversation around AI assistance. You can do that directly, um, functions directly within the AI assistant, which kind of came out um, in December of 23. It does require a little bit more technical expertise. So I have found that Zapier sometimes is easier on some simple integrations that I'm using. Um, but I am like we are building AI assistants um, on top of it, which provides a little bit better in terms of um, from, for example, in terms of like a modified rag, if you will. Um, so if you'll see on my screen in my Slack channel, um, my social team got this. It says LinkedIn post and tweet title AI features RAG technology insights are ready for review and can be found in this Google Doc. And then it is in that Google Doc um, for the team to use. So they can click on it and it's filed in the right spot. It's easy for them to use and takes away a lot of the, the features there. So no, that's a lot um, to cover very quickly. So I'll stop sharing and answer any questions that you guys might have. All right, either in chat or go ahead and unmute yourself and fire away. This is why we record this so you can watch it super slow. Yes. Um, I'm just curious how that custom GPT works with the API? Like, can you go and use that with the API once you create it? You can. So if you use the assistant, it's a little bit easier that you don't have to. Right now, I'm actually working on one where we actually have a Slack function, like where you create your custom like functions that it triggers, retrieves, and then pulls down. Right now, everyone has to access, like some of the ones I'm working on for the most part, are you're accessible through their GPT implementation. So you would just go to your GPT library or they would favor it and it would be easy to access from that perspective. And they can use their phone or their desktop, depending on like when you think about it from a sales perspective. All right. So you just maybe like put it and put it as a model name if you create it and then. Mm -hmm. it's yep. Amazing. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's interesting in terms of rags, in terms of like 
honestly, like, I don't know why anyone would build their own models right now, given the costs that are associated from an infrastructure standpoint and the ability to create your own assistance and your own training models. And basically in essence, like your own rags. Yeah. You don't really train your own model. That's a lot of like, that's expensive and super expensive. Yeah. Um, so Kathleen, kind of uh, there are, like, how do, as an agency, do, should we think about Gemini also now? Because pretty much, is it going to be like, we need Gemini or Bard, which is, um, and then mm -hmm. ChatGPT and Cloudy, like, because there are so many tools we are using right now. Do you see that in future, we will need one, just like you are creating, I already created OpenAI API and create assistant and then input Gemini there also on the same platform. Do you see that way going forward? Yeah, you can, right? You can absolutely do that. Um, from a training, like almost you're in, in essence creating your own rag. What I found, and I think most agencies is you're going to pick one and stick to it, right? Like from a Gemini perspective, there are certain things that it's a little bit better at, but overall I found that I'm able to get very comparable stuff out of open AI. And so I've been sticking to the one model. So I think long-term, like each organization will pick their like front horse, if you will, their horse that they're going to bet on. Um, and that doesn't mean you don't continue to test and evaluate whether it's Gemini or Claude or uh, Mr. All, which is like the LLM in um, France, based out of France that I really like from an open or even Llama, which is actually really good. Um, I always am testing and evaluating them. Um, but from an organization standpoint, we've kind of picked open AI as kind of the lead horse um, just because I've done testing and, and it really is kind of the front runner. Um, and I'm not paid to say that I don't have a sponsorship or at least yet mm. from open AI, although I would love one. Um, but if they're, if they're listening, I, yeah, if they're listening. Yeah. But I do think it's become even, I mean, Claude three is being released to beta right now. And people are saying it can, it's in the same class as Ch chat GPT four, but how soon are we going to see chat GPT five? Right. And, and so there's these platforms, whether it's Gemini, Claude three, that are now be able to hit that same level of performance, but aren't as, as strong from that. But like that's now, and ChatGPT4 was released nine months ago. And I know they have stuff that they're waiting to release on that end, but that's a great question. And you can, like you said, you can use it in terms of you build your own AI systems. You can add in the other models. Other questions? One thing OpenAI actually has a lot of code available on Reddit. Um, pretty much, I think, compared to other F API, I think you know, OpenAI, there are thousands of developers who are releasing the code every day on their forum. So you don't need to recreate everything. If everything is there, a lot of people are releasing it. Yep, exactly. You don't have to start from scratch. You can, mod even on these GPTs that I've been showing you guys, you can modify an existing GPT for yourself or look at some that you've tested and then take some insights from it and apply it to building your own um, from that perspective. And I do have, and I, it's so funny, Drew, I thought I was gonna have so much <laughs> time on this one and I always run out. Um, but here, there are some examples in terms of like custom GPTs that you can build and the idea, the uses, some instruction and some ideas of what you would upload. Um, so you'll have that in the deck. Um, as well. So as you kind of start to think through that, those are also in there. And I've also uh, included my LinkedIn and uh, Twitter and email. So if you have any other questions, my Twitter got shut down and so it's a new one. So don't judge me that I have very few followers on Twitter or X, if you will. You rebel you. I know. Other questions? All right, we are at the top of the hour, so we'll stick around for a minute or two to see if anybody has any last minute questions. Otherwise, it'll take us about a week to get this ready. Again, the easiest way to uh, to get the link and all of that is either be inside the private Facebook group. Uh, that's only open to agency employees and owners, uh, not folks who serve agencies or subscribe to the newsletter. I just put it the link in the chat. Uh, and we'll include that, and we'll all, always include the backlinks to the previous uh, webinars. And then we're back 
April 2nd uh, with round four. So uh, we look yes. forward to seeing you there. So any last Hopefully you guys will have tested Kathleen? a GPT or two out. Yeah. Is there a podcast link for, sorry, Joyce, for what? The podcast you mentioned here is a podcast that will help. Oh, yeah. It's it's the link right above it. See where it says? Oh, I see. Sorry. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. So somebody in chat was asking about the legalities of AI, and we did a podcast with uh, IP attorney Sharon Torek, and so I just put that link in the in the chat for everybody. Thank you. Sorry. Yep. Episode 397, I think, so about 100 episodes ago or close. All right. Kathleen, as always, thank you very much. Thank you. Everybody, thanks for joining us. We will see you in about a month for the April event. In the meantime, uh, watch for us in the newsletter and uh, in the Facebook group if you're looking for links. All right. Good seeing you all. Thank you. Thank you.